I'm going to uh, have a, a little different approach. Uh, my colleagues have talked about measurements we actually collected at the NAPSHM sites for the treatments. I'm going to be talking about how we can expand our NAPSHM database with information that we didn't necessarily collect, that, but could be very important in evaluating soil health. I'm going to concentrate on greenhouse gas emissions coming off of the soils or being uh, absorbed into the soils. I also want to give special uh, thanks to um, Mark Easter and Keith Postian uh, with the Comet team at Colorado State University who uh, helped uh, with this project. The goals uh, of what I want to discuss today first are to estimate uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the various treatments at all of our NAPSHM sites. Secondly, we want to see if we can correlate the simulated uh, Comet Farm carbon stocks with what, what we actually measured. And the ultimate goal is to see if we can get greenhouse gas information collection strategies that can meet a wide range of societal needs. When we talk about greenhouse gases, uh, this is an overview from 2018 EPA. We always concentrate on carbon dioxide, which in your left box is, is certainly uh, the largest component of greenhouse gases. But we also have methane and nitrous oxide uh, that come from our agricultural lands that we need to take a look at. If we switch over to the right box, you can see that agriculture is estimated to uh, uh, produce about 10% of the greenhouse gas emissions across the United States. Now that seems relatively small compared to some of the other uh, components of society. Uh, however, it's still a very large number. And we have this wonderful thing called the soil that can act as a sponge to absorb some of those greenhouse gases. Our ultimate goal is to take that 10% and reduce it and maybe even turn it into a negative number moving forward. A little bit of basic information about greenhouse gases. We talk about carbon dioxide having um, the highest value. However, methane and nitrous oxide that are both released from soils as well uh, may not have as high of a number in terms of volume, but they have larger impact. A lot of the greenhouse gases will be rated based upon calcium or uh, uh, carbonate equivalent, carbon dioxide equivalent. And as you can see from uh, these numbers, even though methane and nitrous oxide are lower in volume, they certainly contribute uh, much greater to the impact of greenhouse gases. It's estimated that on a 160 acre field, which would be about average for a lot of our farms, if we can increase our soil organic carbon by 1%, we can uh, reduce carbon dioxide by about 1,000 tons. Um, that's the equivalent of about 100,000 gallons of gasoline. So the agriculture may be contributing to greenhouse gases, but it can also uh, be the answer to some of the issues that society is facing. And many of our speakers earlier today uh, addressed this. Looking at sources and sinks for greenhouse gases, um, a great reference is quantifying greenhouse gas uh, fluxes in agriculture and forestry. A lot of folks refer to this as the the Blue Book, it was put together in 2014, uh, the work of many, many scientists. And so if you're really interested in how greenhouse gases are influenced by the land resources uh, that are out there, I would highly recommend um, pulling this up and, and looking at it if you haven't already done so. But they talk about how tillage, soil disturbance, soil cover, cropping systems, crop diversity, living roots, soil water, Nutrients all impact greenhouse gases. Well, if we if you think about what we've been talking about all day, those are the same primary management practices that influence our soil health. So I would argue that soil health and greenhouse gases are linked very closely. And if we can uh, obtain some greenhouse gas information for our data set, it will make it much stronger and much pow more powerful as we interpret it. Some of the issues that we have uh, with greenhouse gases is how do we measure it? How do we collect the information? There are direct measurements, they're accurate. However, they can be quite costly and they're limited to points in space. We can also do non-direct measurements, which is what we did with several of our uh, NAPSHM indicators. We can take soil samples, we can send them to the lab, we 
can measure. So I've got a carbon, active carbon, CO2 evolution, all the things that my colleagues have been talking about. That is also limited. It can be a little, a little costly, depending on how much detail and what kind of uh, spatial areas that you want to measure. There are many, many models out there that attempt to simulate the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that come from our agricultural landscape. And uh, these models obviously aren't measuring anything directly, but they have the advantage of being able to cover large tracts of land, large areas, large resource areas, as well as uh, taking into consideration the moisture, the temperature that, that occurs at various locations. And then there are combinations of networks where measurements have been taken in this example. Dan talked about the rapid carbon assessment uh, program at the NRCS. Um, tens of thousands of measurements have been made and we can at least make maps of how carbon is being stored generally. Uh, one problem with this is it's not, uh, you know, measuring in, a direct, in an exact area. We chose to uh, run simulations for carbon um, in our, in our uh, treatments using the Comet Farm tool. And there's a lot of other models out there, but the Comet Farm tool itself has been around a while. It's accepted at USDA. And we thought that was a good starting point. It's, it's not the only model that can be used to estimate greenhouse gas emissions. It's developed at Colorado State University at the Natural Resources Ecology Laboratory uh, with the help of NRCS uh, Office of um, the Chief Economist, as well as the Agricultural Research Service. It's driven by the DASET model, and I'm not going to have time to talk about that, but you can get on CometFarm.com if you want to learn more about how the model works. And it is free, it's accessible over the internet. One of the issues we had with trying to run Comet Farm simulations with our data set is where did we start? Uh, we, didn't, we didn't know in a lot of cases what the soil organic carbon values were, and we we're using soil organic carbon to estimate the storage of CO2. We did have measurements that we took in 2019. And in this example, uh, I'm just using treatments like conventional till, no-till, and, and a no-till plus a cover crop as treatments that occurred at a given site. So we had a measurement. The Comet Farm model itself runs simulations uh, with a 20-year baseline. And it provides annual changes in soil organic carbon uh, for whatever set of data, metadata that you enter into the model. We took the baseline years, 2000 to 2019, and got an average estimate of soil organic carbon change for every treatment that we evaluated within this project. We then took the number of years associated with the, pro with the individual experiment, backtracked, and took an average of all of those annual readings over time to come up with an estimated baseline for where we started our soil organic carbon uh, when the treatments first went in. Then we use that baseline to correlate back to the measurements we made. Now there are a lot of other ways we could have tried to attempt this, but uh, our first uh, look at getting an estimation on how the model was performing was to go through this process. I'm gonna have a few charts here where we take a look at the uh, comparison of our measured values versus what was predicted using the Comet Farm uh, model. And on these, if on the left of, of the zero bar is where the treatments were underestimated by the model compared to what we measured, and on the right is where they were overestimated by the model. I'm using uh, this site in, at West Lafayette, Indiana as an example of how the model performed against measurements. Uh, at this site, we looked at um, crop rotation versus tillage. And one thing that we noticed at, at several of our sites was under no-till, the model appeared to slightly be overestimating uh, the amount of carbon that was actually uh, uh, put into the, the soil at those treatments. But uh, if you look at this, all of these came within 15% error of measured versus um, uh, simulated, which I think is very tight considering it was a 44 year trial. 
and all of the assumptions that were made. One thing I'd like to point out with this particular slide is that the moldboard plow and the chisel plow were both what entered in the model as intensive tillage operations. However, the moldboard plow have much more intensity to it than the chisel plow. Uh, the model performed quite well because it assumed that the chisel plow was treated like the moldboard plow. In reality, with the less soil disturbance associated with it, you would have expected more soil carbon and the model picked that up. So this is an example of how we can use our data set to maybe improve some of the components of these various uh, models that are used to estimate uh, greenhouse gas emissions. A second site I wanted to share with you is where we would have a cover crop component. And this site is in New York, Poplar Ridge, New York. Uh, and it was a 46 year trial. And once again, the treatments themselves that were measured, the model came within 15% of those in terms of predicting what the carbon level should have been that we measured. And uh, again, over 46 years, I think that uh, that's a, a very strong and flexible uh, diagnosis by the model. And it, uh, it gives me confidence that it's working well when we're uh, validating it with some of these long-term sites. We also wanted to look at things uh, such as organic nutrient inputs, which will definitely affect the carbon stock and, and help store CO2 in the soils. This is a site at Kimberly, Idaho, where we looked at uh, no nutrients, organic nutrients versus inorganic nutrients. And once again, regardless of the treatments, the model was falling well under 15% error compared to what we actually measured. Uh, this is an eight year trial. A lot less time has gone by and it's a little tighter in terms of uh, you look at the model predictions are within 5% of what we actually measured. Uh, once again, showing some strength in using something that didn't involve sampling that was validated by the samples we collected. We've only ran 20 of our 87 US sites so far, and this is uh, all of the preliminary data uh, to date. Uh, taking a look at the percent change in the predicted versus the measured carbon values. And since we used average treatments at each site, you would expect these to be mirrored uh, around zero, and that was certainly the case. But if you look at this range, 75% of the treatments that we've uh, evaluated to date fell within 20% measured versus predicted by the model. And 59% of the treatments fell within 10% predicted versus measured by the model. I, I do believe uh, if this trend continues, uh, there will be a comfort level uh, that we have by using something that wasn't designed for small plot research to help add information to those that are using sm small plot research to, uh, to give us a better handle on how things are influencing greenhouse gases. I did want to show you uh, a chart where we looked at tillage and we ran the model across all of those 20 sites to date. The, the yellow bar is the uh, CO2 that's evolved from urea applications. The brown bar is the nitrous oxide uh, that's coming off of these sites. The light blue bar is the uh, soil carbon and uh, a negative means that the soil is storing the greenhouse gas in the form of organic carbon rather than releasing it as CO2. And then the dark blue bar, bar is the total greenhouse gas emissions predicted by the model using the treatment metadata that we collected at all of these sites. I think one thing that's really interesting to, to notice is we are storing carbon in all of these systems uh, as CO2, but until we hit no-till, the other greenhouse gases that are evolving from the soils are, are uh, counterbalancing and actually adding more total greenhouse gas emissions uh, from the system. When we hit no-till, we're fairly neutral. What we're absorbing through CO2 by laying down carbon is equaling the other greenhouse gases that we're, lo we're losing, that we're not storing. And somewhere between no-till and our reference perennial grasses that were at some of these sites is where we actually start 
uh, a net accumulation of greenhouse gases in our soil, which is our ultimate goal. And the model, uh, at least based upon using the metadata from our site, performed quite nicely in showing these trends. Very, very promising. In conclusion, I would like to say that in this particular um, evaluation, the measured versus the simulated solar organic carbon track very similarly. We know that greenhouse gas emissions are affected by land management, and we know that both land management and the measuring greenhouse gas emissions will uh, help us quantify soil health. And I also believe these long-term ag experiments are very, very valuable for a lot of activities to come. In this case, we were able to take some measurements, we were able to take some simulations and, uh, and calibrate them very closely. And so I want to put, give kudos to our uh, scientists that helped us that maintain these sites, allowed us access to the sites and our funders as well. And with that